Okay, so let's let's stay away. From, let's veer away from that, so the H part at the moment, and and come back to investing because you gave some clues about the sorts of things people should look for. So first of all, we should probably identify the type of investors who would invest in nickel because this is this is not an overnight day trading scenario or even get out in the next six months or so. You, you if you're coming in now, and I, I guess you would advocate getting in now, or would you? Well, I would say if. if what do you think the average amount of money your investor has to invest? Do you think five thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars? Don't know. There's there's all sorts okay, in well, there. There's well, so well, many of them. Well, the average is difficult. Okay. Well, let's just say you have a dollar to invest in nickel. I, I don't think I would just go buy a dollar worth of nickel equity today, right? Mm. Like I think you want to cost average in over time. Mm -hmm. But but certainly you know what we saw in rhodium and palladium, you know, and, and a lot of other commodities is they can move really quickly. And so yeah. if you actually do subscribe to this, this notion that EV adoption is generating new demand that's going to impact the price of nickel, like if you mm -hmm. subscribe to that, that notion, mm -hmm. uh, that investment thesis, then I think you over time want to average in to these nickel names. I wouldn't go buy, spend all my nickel allocation today. Today, okay. Especially in the face, by the way, of a lot of uncertainty around coronavirus. Absolutely, okay. Uh, but, but I would think that over time you would want to leg into it. Okay. I, th I think that's fair, and again, reasonable. Um, yeah. Like I say, you know, there's a lot of people come and talk to us and tell us how much of their commodity they're going to put into a battery, and the EV revolution is going to change their company literally overnight. You need to buy now, and I just think sometimes for some companies, well, for a lot of companies, that's not true. They're so far away, so far removed from the EV chain. Well, timing is tough. Like, look at lithium. Right. You know, lithium Always. has moved. I mean, some of these names, they move overnight. You know, Lithium Americas. I mean, just on a rocket ship lately, they announced mm. this deal, uh, which effectively takes away the operatorship. They get money in. Yeah. Now it's going to be built. So this thing goes on a rocket ship. But you can't. So I would just say, as an investor, yeah, it's hard to predict. So one of the things I would consider, I guess, uh, when I look at some of these names, is, is making sure to own some names that don't require capital raises because right. Right. if between now and that move, mm. you know, it's two years, let's just say. Yeah. If you look into that balance sheet and you can see that they're gonna need two capital raises, well just just wait and and, yeah. and go in on the capital raise. So yeah. I think, you know, in particular for the juniors this is relevant. Because like from my perspective, if you can invest in nickel, mm. like, you know, let's own a basket of names. Yeah. So own Spread independent own independence group, right? And this is a this is an adult company, it's producing nickel and it's hard to foresee that they're gonna raise capital. Now you're not going to get as much torque as you would in like a Giga with Turnigan, right? Right. But at the same at the same time, it's a much safer right. a safer bet. So I think you have to have like a range of these names. Right. Okay. And that's just nickel we're talking about. Yeah. Obviously, people have got lots of options, not just mining, well, but not just nickel the commodity, but lots of options within mining and outside of mining. Oh, for sure. And portfolio approaches, I think, what most sensible people would, would advocate. So I buy that. Let's come back to some of the specific things that you've started writing about. <laughs> started writing we'll about. We'll get there. Yeah. <laughs> um, in terms of things that you look for. Okay, the first thing we talk about is the exchange. You, yeah. talk, you talked about, right, you've got to work out which exchanges you're comfortable being on. Why? Well, if you look at different commodities, do better in, on different exchanges, right? Okay. So, for instance, it's actually from nickel. Yeah, I mean, right? yeah, and then like it's actually nickel does better on the ASX. If, if we're being honest, a, the ASX, okay. and the reason is, is the retail investors in Australia understand nickel. Mm -hmm. There is a larger number of nickel publicly traded companies for nickel, mm -hmm. and so I, I would say, you know, depending on where the asset is, that makes more sense. Now, for gold. Canadian and North American producers do better, generally speaking, on the TSX. Yeah. Australian producers do better. And there are always exceptions on the ASX. So I think understanding um, comps for that exchange is important because mm. you know if you have peers which look sort of similar, that means you're going to have research coverage. It also means you're going to have like a general body of knowledge among retail and institutional investors. Mm -hmm. And so it'll be easier for them to get up the curve and potentially invest in, in the name that you're looking at. So, right. so you know, it is it is always uh, important to think about, you know, the peer groups. Now, in a bull market, of course, like probably it doesn't matter as much. Mm. But in a market like this, you know, I think you can actually have a, quite a bit of uh, upward support in these names when you're on the right exchange. Okay, okay, so that's that's interesting to me. But like, I'll give you a data point, just not yeah, not please. a plug, but Conic Metals, right? right. The, the primary asset in Conic Metals is. Uh, is the Ramu nickel yep. joint venture. We discussed. So, yeah, so that joint venture, 
assets looking almost exactly as conic as today. Yeah. Not quite as good because there's more in conic. Trading on the ASX was trading at kind of 100, 110 million market cap. Today on the TSX, it trades at 30 million. There's, there's a bunch mm. of other factors in there, but, but right. it's just one single example. Right. So I think you can find that though across different commodities. Okay, so but what we're going to do, we're going to piece together lots of moving parts here, and, yeah. and you've got to consider all of these con exactly, concurrently, yeah. okay? So you've sort of talked about project stage. Yeah. So if there's anything more you want to say, we, you, can, you can sprinkle it in later. But I want to talk about jurisdiction. Yeah. It kind of comes to the point we made earlier with regards to you know where your nickel project is. Um, some countries are better than others. You know, we've got you, you, you're dealing with in Southeast Asia, yeah. Indonesia. Um, you've got the, you know, some Canadian plays, you've got you know, Russians. There's, there's a lot of big players out there. Why is jurisdiction specifically important to nickel? Well, let's look at like um, Cuba, okay? So share it, mm -hmm. which is you know, an important Cuba. producer of nickel, mm -hmm. fundamentally has a problem where a lot of investors are not allowed to invest in that company mm -hmm. because they're US yeah. or because the fund has US investors. Yeah. So then you have a problem with Cuba, even though great mine, great asset, right? Yeah. Uh, Russia, maybe you don't have restrictions, but at the same time, people have perceptions about Russia. Yeah. And, so, and so, and so, like when you kind of go around, you know, clearly the best nickel assets to invest in would either be in Australia or Canada from the perspective of the market. Right. But you know, there are interesting things in Africa as well, like this this project. Uh, I think it's Sama Resources, right? It's, right potentially a large discovery in West Africa, but it, I think it doesn't get as much credit as it would in... It, Not it, heard them. Yeah, exactly. In the right. TSA, or excuse me, in Canada or Australia because of its location. So, uh, it, look, you know, investors over the years have had bad experiences in Africa uh, and, and certain countries. And so it just makes sense, just like in gold, if that asset is sitting in Canada, it's going to have a higher multiple than if it's yeah. sitting in somewhere in Africa generally. It's interesting. So that, that's in West Africa so, yeah. somewhere. Okay, fine. I think Robert Friedland invested a bunch of money in it. Um, his technology is on it. Yeah, but I mean, it's an interesting story because it's potentially huge, right? It's just yeah. one example of a name where if that same asset was sitting in a different jurisdiction, you know, yeah. it would have probably a materially higher market cap. Well, absolutely. I mean, we... I mean, talk, talking of things that affect, you know, different jurisdictional plays, you know, we, we had a contributor send in a piece about what's happening in West Africa at the moment. And I wish more companies would respond to this, um, to, to these sorts of articles where, you know, there's, there's a bunch of sort of terrorist activity happening in you know, places like Burkina Faso and you know, Southern Mali and you know, Liberia and so, so forth. And the companies are choosing to ignore these things. And we've had a few phone calls for allowing someone to publish on our site talking about these negative things. Um, but I think it's a great moment for the companies to come on and talk to us and say, well, actually, it's fine. This is going on, which is not good, but it's business as usual for us. It's not going to affect our operations. But rather than bury their heads in the sand and, and uh, try and get their PR people to tell us we shouldn't be having these conversations. So jurisdiction is important, I, I, th I think, because you know, we've set, definitely been caught out. We've definitely lost money um, you know, investing in the wrong jurisdiction and these kind of safer place or more relevant place for nickel um, well ho ho hopefully they will they will work out for your company you talk about you know indonesia png png yeah is it P oh papua new guinea so oh, yeah. apologies i think so, no no uh, but yeah i mean same general region so okay um so i mean i mean how's, how's it doing business there for instance, I mean, it's something you must know. Yeah, about I mean, that I mean, right we're now, very right? for, we're very fortunate in yeah. in that because MCC, which is a very large mm. company, mm -hmm. uh, is operating the mine. Yeah. So I think we're fortunate just because um, we they, don't have to deal with you know, a lot of the data. We don't deal with any of the data. Today. In fact, we're not the operators, right. so we're just a joint venture interest holder. Right. Uh, and because they're such a big company, I think that you know uh, they're able to navigate. But it's not without it's not without its headaches, right? I think that's mm. true of anywhere though, and. You can experience that in the U.S. and Canada as well. So that's like, so it comes back to your, you know, invest in royalty. It's it's investing in mining without the mining risk. Exactly, exactly. So you love it. So your job's a lot easier, is it? Well, it's definitely easier than building a mine. I can tell you. Right. <laughs> that would be tough. Right. Um, we talk about you talk about project types. You 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 know kind of you get into a lot of detail about this. I mean, what do, what do you mean by project? Type is, is coming back to the nickel. Yeah, so, that, so yeah, forth. there's kind of. I mean, look, there's a you know some geologist comes on here, they can criticize and say, well, there's really twenty types, but basically there are two types. 
in the sulfide mm. and the laterite. Those, mm -hmm. those are two of the primary ore yep. bodies that we talk about. The laterite ore bodies have the HPAL process, uh, which is very hard to get right, mm -hmm. uh, and certainly has a history of, of massive cost overruns. Mm. Uh, sulfide has always been preferred until the HPAL technology come, came along, but yep. what you're facing today is the known nickel sulfide ore bodies tend to be lower grade, Right. And so it just means you have to process more ore and the capex, you know, I, I can't think of a project with under a billion dollar capex. I'm sure there's some small project somewhere, but mm. but by and large, once again, talking about a billion to a billion five, and the market's just not ready to fund that. There's just no actual money to fund a project like that, which is kind of what makes Nickel interesting because um, there are known projects out there, mm. at, you know, Dumont being one of the fully permitted ones, for yep. instance. Got scale. But, you know, it's probably one, five to $2 billion and no one's sticking their hand up. And if you stick your hand up right now today, it's probably, you know, four years from commercial, five years from commercial production.